Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2024. Welcome to lesson number 11, The Impending Conflict, ready for teaching on June 15. The author of the series of lessons on the Great Controversy is Pastor Mark Finlay, and your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, June 8. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word shows us in so many ways what your grace is like, what your love is like, what you have done for your people in the past. And as we look at this week's lesson, Lord, about things that are coming in the future, we just pray that we may have the assurance that you will still be the same God that you were before, and that you will be with us, and that your love will be shown through us to those about us, and that we may know that we can put our trust in you. Lord, as we open your word, we pray your Holy Spirit will guide us. May our thinking be clear. May our understanding be such that we will know that you are the God that we serve. And we thank you for what Jesus has done for each of us. And because of what he's done, we can each have eternal life. And today I'd like to pray for Thelma Ray in the Virgin Islands and Virginia Mendoza and her family and Irene White and Sabbath schools all around the world, whether in a grand tabernacle or under a mango tree. Particularly this week, I'd like to pray for our children. May we show them that we have assurance in Jesus, even though our topic this week could be seen as scary. Let us always put our trust in you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John 17 and verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Let's read that again. John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. There is a relatively new medical device called a biochip or very chip about the size of a grain of rice that can be implanted in a patient. The biochip contains information about the patient's medical history, which can then be obtained by passing an external scanner across the area where the biochip or very chip has been inserted. Some Christians see this as part of a conspiracy to enforce the mark of the beast. For others, the mark of the beast has to do with the barcodes on cans of food, or it is a mysterious number on dollar bills that supposedly adds up to 666. For some, it has to do with the Masonic Order, the Illuminati, black UN helicopters, or the United Nations. The aim of this week's lesson is to reveal the coming conflict over worship. Satan will challenge God's authority by attempting to undermine God's law. Specifically, the Sabbath will become the centre of a global conflict over worship. Satan hates the Sabbath because he hates the Creator. He will use coercion, pressure and force to break our commitment to Christ. There will be a collision of beliefs over the true and false day of worship. God's final appeal is an appeal to faithfulness to Christ despite persecution, an economic boycott, imprisonment and a death decree. This week's study emphasises Jesus' strength to take us through earth's final conflict. Sunday, June 9. Revelation's Final Conflict The message of Revelation is much more than cryptic symbols, strange beasts and odd images. It speaks of eternal truths given by a loving God to an end-time generation. The conflict between Christ and Satan began in heaven over worship. It will come to its final climax over worship. Compare Revelation 14, 7 and 9 with Revelation 4, 11, 
what is the overarching theme of Revelation in this conflict between good and evil? Revelation 14, 7, He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And verse 9, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, and Revelation 4, verse 11, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Throughout Revelation, worship and creation are indissolubly linked. Revelation 14.7 calls us to worship the Lord of all creation. Against the backdrop of evolution, which has taken the world by storm during the past two centuries, the Sabbath is an eternal reminder of our identity. It constantly reinforces that we are created beings and our Creator is worthy of our allegiance and worship. This is one reason the devil hates the Sabbath so much. Read Revelation twelve seventeen and chapter 14, verse 12. How does worshipping the Creator find its final expression? Revelation 12, beginning at verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. And Revelation 14, 12, This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep His commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Worshipping the Creator through keeping the commandments of God stands in direct opposition to worshipping the beast. God will have an end-time people who are loyal to Him despite the greatest opposition and fiercest persecution in history. From the Great Controversy, from the Great Controversy, page 605, we read, While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath, in obedience to God's law, is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. End of quote. Revelation 14.12 states that these committed followers of the Saviour will have the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is a faith so deep that it trusts when it cannot see. It perseveres when it cannot understand. It is a gift from Jesus that we receive by faith and will carry us through the impending conflict. And so to finish the day, the seventh day Sabbath is so foundational a symbol of God as creator that it goes back to Eden itself. Thus, to seek to usurp it as Rome did, and we'll look at Daniel 7.25 in a moment, is to seek to usurp the authority of God at the most foundational level possible. God as creator. And Daniel 7.25, He will speak against the Most High and oppress His holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into His hands for a time, times, and half a time. How does this truth help us see why it will be such a controverted point in the last days? Monday, June 10, The Coming Crisis The Mark of the Beast prophecy in Revelation 13 tells us about the fiercest and very worst stage of Satan's war against God. Ever since Jesus died on the cross, the enemy has known he was defeated, but he is determined to take as many as possible down with him. His first strategy in this campaign is deception. When deception does not work, he resorts to force. He is ultimately behind the decree that anyone who refuses to worship the beast or receive his mark will be put to death. 
Religious persecution, of course, is not new. It has been around ever since Cain killed Abel for obeying God's command. Jesus said it would happen even among believers. Read John 16.2, Matthew 10, verse 22, 2 Timothy 3.12, and 1 Peter 4.12. What did the New Testament church experience, and how does that apply to Christ's end-time church? First of all, John 16, verse 2, They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. And Matthew 10, verse 22, You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, In fact, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. Throughout Christian history, persecution was common. It happened in pagan Rome, but was especially evident in the vicious persecutions of Bible-believing Christians by the medieval church. The mark of the beast is the final link in this hellish chain. Like past persecutions, it is designed to force everyone to conform to a certain set of beliefs and an approved system of worship. The prophecy indicates that persecution will start with economic sanctions. No one can buy or sell unless they have the mark. Anyone who refuses to receive the mark will eventually be placed under a death decree, as you read in Revelation 13, verse 15, the second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed, and verse 17, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. The devil already is preparing professed Christians to receive the mark of the beast when the final test comes by encouraging them to make compromises in their lives. When it appears that the whole world is following the beast in wondering admiration, Revelation 13.3, suddenly the scene changes and the prophetic camera focuses on God's people. Revelation 13.3 reads, One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. Revelation 14.12 gives us this picture. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God's people live lives of godly obedience. By His grace, they stand firm when everything is shaking all around them. While the world is following the beast, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Revelation 14 verse 4. By the power of Christ, they triumph over the powers of hell arrayed against them. As we saw in Lesson 9, the central conflict between good and evil is over worship. The beast uses deception, and, when that fails, force and coercion. And so to finish the day, how quickly now do you allow, if at all, economic considerations to compromise your Sabbath-keeping. Tuesday, June 11, Identifying the Beast, Part 1. Read Revelation, Chapter 13, Verses 1 and 2. Where does this beast rise from, and who gives it authority? Revelation 13, beginning at verse 1. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea, and it had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. 
The book of Revelation identifies the dragon primarily as Satan. Revelation 12, 3-5 says the dragon attempted to destroy, as soon as it was born, the male child who was later caught up to God and his throne. Revelation 12, beginning at verse 3. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. It was the devil working through pagan Rome who tried to destroy Christ as we see in Matthew two sixteen to 18 when Herod realised that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, Weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. The enemy of God and humanity works through political and religious institutions to accomplish his purposes. About this beast power, we're told in Revelation 13 too, the dragon gave him his power, his throne and great authority. This prophecy was precisely fulfilled hundreds of years later when the Roman Emperor Constantine moved his capital from Rome to what came to be called Constantinople in modern-day Turkey. This left a power vacuum at the former throne or seat of the Caesars, the imperial city of Rome. Thus, pagan Rome gave the beast its seat or capital city. Isaac Bacchus stated in The Infinite Importance of the Obedience of Faith and the Separation from the World, page 16, quoted in Leroy Edwin Froome's The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, volume 3, page 213, by removing the seat of the empire to Constantinople, Constantine made way for the Bishop of Rome to exalt himself above all men upon earth and above the God of heaven. End of quote. According to Thomas Hobbes, the papacy is no other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire, sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. End of quote. And that comes from his book Leviathan, page 386. A careful analysis reveals that the sea beast of Revelation 13 is an apostate religious power that rises out of Rome and becomes a worldwide system of worship, as we read in Revelation 13 verses 3 and 4. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? This beast is not a person. It is a religious organisation that has substituted the truth of God's word for human decrees. Read Revelation 13 verses 1 and 6. What key word is used to identify the beast power? Revelation 13, 1. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea. I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. And verse 6. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. 
The Bible defines blasphemy in John 10.33 and Luke 51 with two examples. One, a man pretending to be or claiming to be God. And two, a man claiming the power to forgive sins. Let's check those verses. John 10.33 We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. And Luke 5.21 The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? These accusations against Jesus were unjust because he is truly God and therefore has the right to forgive sins. The Roman papacy has two distinctive doctrines that the Bible calls blasphemy. It claims that its priests have the power to forgive sins and that the Pope has the prerogatives of God on earth. Wednesday, June 12, Identifying the Beast, Part 2 Rather than worshipping the beast, God's people find their greatest joy and highest delight in worshipping Him. Their obedience springs from their heart of love. They are committed to Him because they know how committed He is to them. Read Revelation 13, verse 5. Write this identifying characteristic in the space below. Revelation 13, 5. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. Recall from Lesson 4 that God gives us a key for understanding prophetic time. One prophetic day equals one literal year, as we read previously, but let's do it again. Numbers 14, verse 34. For forty years, one year for each of the forty days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. And Ezekiel 4, verse 6. After you have finished this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the people of Judah. I have assigned you forty days, a day for each year. Calculating the time period of forty-two months mentioned in Revelation 13 verse 5, using the thirty-day Hebrew month equals 1,260 prophetic days or literal years. The papacy exercised great influence from A.D. 538 to 1798 A.D. But when Berthier, Napoleon's general, took the Pope captive in A.D. 1798, the prophetic period of papal supremacy ended and Revelation's prophecy was fulfilled. Revelation 13.10 reads, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. The blow to the papacy was extremely serious, but not fatal. According to Revelation 13.12, the deadly wound would be healed. It reads, It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf, and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. The papacy's influence, once again, would be felt worldwide. Today, world leaders welcome the pontiff as an ambassador of the Church of Rome and visit him regularly at the Vatican. In a world of unprecedented instability, the scene is being set for the Roman pontiff to become the acclaimed moral leader of the world who can bring people together. During his speech on the 6th of June 2012 to more than 15,000 people gathered in St Peter's Square in Rome, Pope Benedict XVI declared, Sunday is the day of the Lord and of men and women, a day in which everyone must be able to be free, free for the family and free for God. In defending Sunday, we defend human freedom. End of quote. And that was accessed from the internet from the Vatican on October 10, 2022. 
The great controversy clearly reveals where this movement will one day ultimately lead. We read from the great controversy, page 592, those who honour the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. Ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained of God. In legislative halls and courts of justice, commandment keepers will be misrepresented and condemned. End of quote. And so to finish the day, However hard it is now to see something like this happening, look at how quickly our world can change. What should these changes tell us about how quickly end-time events can come upon us? Thursday, June 13, The Beast from the Earth Read Revelation 13, verses 11 to 18. How does the second beast differ from the first beast of Revelation 13? Revelation 13, beginning at verse 11. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given, power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honour of the beast, who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is six six. Six. The first beast rose out of the sea. The second beast comes up out of the earth in verse 11. The sea represents peoples, multitudes, nations and tongues. We read in Revelation 17, 15. Let's read the whole verse. Revelation 17, 15. Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations and languages. The earth then represents a sparsely populated area of the world. This second beast arises near the close of the prophetic period during which the first beast exercises authority in verse 5. That is, it rises to prominence around 1798. Revelation 13 verse 5 reads, The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. The United States precisely fits this description. It declared its independence in A.D. 1776, adopted its constitution in A.D. 1789, and was recognised as a world power by the late 19th century. John continues in verse 11, He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Horns in Bible prophecy symbolise power. Unlike the first beast, this beast had no crowns on its horns, suggesting it is not a monarchy. The two horns represent the two primary governing principles that are the source of the United States' power and success, political and religious liberty. Read Revelation 13 verses 11 and 12 again. What change do you see in this beast and how does it speak? 
Revelation 13, beginning at verse 11. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. This gentle, lamb-like nation ultimately speaks like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in verse 12 and abandons its principles of religious liberty, causing the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, also in verse 12. The United States will lead out in requiring everyone on earth to worship the first beast by recognising the papacy's spiritual and secular authority. According to this prophecy, the United States forms an image to the beast, a union of church and state, and it will require everyone to worship this image. What's fascinating is that at the time when first identified as this beast power, the United States was nowhere near the military and economic behemoth it was to become and remains now. And so to finish the day, Think about the political instability in America today. How might that one day lead to the fulfilment of this prophecy? Friday, June 14. Further thought. Worshipping the beast and its image alludes to Daniel 3, in which Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were commanded by the king of Babylon to bow down to a golden image or be thrown into a fiery furnace. Ancient Babylon, modern Babylon, the issue is worship. True worship springs from a mind taught by God's word, a soul transformed by his love and a heart filled with his spirit. Then we will not be conformed to this world, but live according to God's will, which is found in his word. That is our only safety. From the Great Controversy, page 591, we read, God never forces the will or the conscience, but Satan's constant resort to gain control of those whom he cannot otherwise seduce is compulsion by cruelty. Through fear or force, he endeavours to rule the conscience and to secure homage to himself. To accomplish this, he works through both religious and secular authorities, moving them to the enforcement of human laws in defiance of the law of God. End of quote. And then from page 593, in order to endure the trial before them, they must understand the will of God as revealed in his word. They can honour him only as they have a right conception of his character, government and purposes, and act in accordance with them. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. End of quote. And then from page 595. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, in its support. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, how can we live in the expectation of the coming of Christ and share that hope without becoming alarmists? Two, dwell more on the question of worship. What does our daily life, our daily routine, tell us about who or what we worship? 3. How can we help ourselves and others face the future with confidence and not with fear? And 4. What practical difference does understanding last day events make in our lives today?
And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. No to Pork and Yes to Sabbath by Andrew McChesney Sarah thought about the Seventh-day Adventist Church as she helped her mother sell pork and beer in Mozambique in South East Africa. Why do Adventists go to church on Saturday, she wondered. As a small girl, Sarah had gone to the Adventist Church several times with her big brother, who was an Adventist. But then he had moved to another town and she had gone back to the church of her mother. As she worked with her mother, memories about the Adventist church returned. She thought about Adventist neighbours who had moved next door. Sarah decided to ask them why they went to church on Saturday. The neighbours welcomed Sarah's question and they opened the Bible to the fourth commandment in Exodus 20 verses 8 to 10. Sarah read, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, in the New King James Version. She also read other verses about the holiness of the seventh day Sabbath. She saw that Jesus worshipped on the seventh day when he lived on earth. She decided to keep the seventh day Sabbath. Mother was furious when Sarah told her that she would no longer sell pork and beer on Saturdays. She forbade Sarah from going to the Adventist church. Sarah went anyway. She wanted to honour her mother as God commands in the fifth commandment in Exodus 20 verse 12. But she also realised that it was more important to obey God rather than man in Acts 5 verse 29. Tensions escalated further when Sarah stopped selling pork and beer altogether. She explained to mother that God does not condone the eating of unclean meat such as pork, as stated in Leviticus 11 verse 7, or the drinking of alcohol from Proverbs 20 verse 1. Furthermore, she said, The Bible teaches that whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, as stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31. And selling products unapproved by God would not glorify him. Mother threw Sarah out of the house. With nowhere to go, Sarah left downtown and moved in with her Adventist brother and his wife and their sons. Her heart was heavy. Is this the cost of following Jesus, she wondered? Sarah's brother presented her case to leaders at his church. Through their efforts, an Adventist pastor met with Mother. She listened carefully to what he said. She didn't agree with him on everything. But her face softened as they spoke. She said Sarah could return home. Today, Mother still does not share Sarah's convictions. Sarah is praying for the Holy Spirit to touch her heart. She knows that the God who gave her a fuller understanding of His love can do the same for her mother. Thank you for your Sabbath School mission offerings that help spread the good news of Jesus' soon coming in Africa and all around the world.